What's up guys, Ryan Sprague here, and I'm just dropping in to remind you about our Patreon campaign. Somewhere in the Skies is always free to consume, but it's not free to create. So if you want to help the show on a monthly basis, we have tons of rewards for you in return, including shoutouts on the show and website, bonus content and episodes, and free merch. Want to be my guest or pick a topic for the show? You can do that too. So if you'd like to learn more and to help support the show, visit patreon.com slash somewhere skies. Thank you and keep looking up. This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Spread. Let's do it. As per usual, we speak for 30 minutes before we even start recording with right. the one and only Shannon Legro. Shannon, welcome back to Somewhere in the Skies. Oh, I thank you. Good, sir. So good to be back. It really is. Every time we talk, it's like a, a mini reunion um, for many who may or may not know. Shannon and I have worked together a lot in the past on several projects into the fray radio on the trail of ufos but today we're talking about something built from the ground up from you and that is your new book paramalgamation with beyond the fray publishing so before we get to that i gotta ask shan um a lot has happened since we last spoke about your last book bigfoot and um When we last spoke, uh, it was with you and Seth Breedlove, and we talked all about On the Trail of UFOs when it first came out. So how's it been going with that? How's the reception been with On the Trail of UFOs? Reception is uh, fantastic, which uh, I'm sure that you can parrot this, but I have been inundated with uh, messages and emails and followers and people that are, are ready to talk about their UFO sightings, which is amazing. Uh, you know, for me personally, I haven't really seen anything very strange in the sky, unlike yourself. So for me, the filming, of course, was kind of something that lit the fire for me as far as the UFO subject goes. That's not my niche. It's not where I live. Uh, Bigfoot at the top, I'd say, and then all of the other kind of random paranormal stuff underneath that. But doing that project has definitely fired it up for me in the UFO subject. So, uh, yeah. And ever since, of course it is free right now on Amazon prime. You can go right now on there guys and watch all, all the episodes are available to you, but yeah, it's been an explosion ever since that, of course, uh, with people finding out about all of us that are, are a part of that project, including yourself. I, I mean, I can admit it's, it's blown the doors wide open with me. I've had complete strangers who've never followed my work, never read my book, nothing, uh, heard the podcast, uh, reach out to me and say, hey, I saw you on this really cool thing on Amazon, and I'm looking forward to diving into UFOs. So hey, right there, we're getting people who have never looked at the UFO topic in a serious manner, like you guys did in On the Trail of UFOs. And uh, we are growing this community of people who are now interested in UFOs. So if anything, uh, we have amassed more. We've recruited more into our army. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty happy about that. And honored Insert to evil it. laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, your, yes. your laugh is so much better. <laughs> I just sounded I mean, insane. hey, you know, it's, an, well, I mean, as, as well we are in some ways, but um, yeah, true. It, it, it's, in, it's ingrained in you in there. It, it has to be. <laughs> it's, it's deep down somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well, okay. So before we get to the, the contents of the book, Shan, we have to discuss the title of the book. You even define it in the beginning of the book. So what is paramalgamation? And you say it very well. Not everyone can, can say oh, it actually I had properly. To, I had to train myself. I was saying it like in the mirror for almost an hour before we got on. <laughs> so I wouldn't screw it up. You're doing like the people that sing the like, eo, eo, yeah. ya, ya, bumblebee, bumblebee. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Paramalgamation, and it, this is actually uh, originally a title of one of my episodes, and uh, 
Except for tonight's episode, and it's funny that I'm just now saying this because this episode that's going to come out tonight, it's a Thursday night. For the life of me, I usually pride myself on coming up with a cool title and it's catchy or people go, mm, that what in the hell is this? Let me try. I couldn't come up with a goddamn thing, so it's called Bigfoot Dash West Virginia. How about that for originality? Boom. So no, but to the yeah. Point. But this particular episode, it was just all over the place with all this crazy stuff going on. And I'm like, man, this is a friggin' amalgamation of just all kinds of crap. What am I gonna call this episode? I'm like Amalgamation, paramalgamation, para okay, and it just kind of popped into my noggin. So, um, yeah, it's just, the title is an amalgamation of various paranormal uh, activities and incidents and experiences that people have, and it's some of my favorites, meaning that it either has a whole bunch of stuff all in one story in uh, that happened to one person, or it is just so damn hard to classify. Mm -hmm. I think those are my all-time favorites, or things that you just go, what in the hell am I even going to label this as? It, it doesn't go in a nice little package like a Bigfoot or or a ghost that's walking down the hallway with the chains on them. You know, mm -hmm. uh, these are stories that are just go you're going, I don't know what the hell that is. <laughs> exactly. No, I think it was the perfect title. And um, for anyone who doesn't know, these books that you're coming out with be with Beyond the Fray, um, correct me if I'm wrong, these are either directly from people you interviewed on your podcast Into the Fray, or they are uh, stories that were brought to you. Is that right? Absolutely. Yep. Some of them were... Uh, most were on the air, and then uh, there is another large person that was off the air and or uh, emailed in, and then I can you know email back and forth with somebody if they're not comfortable talking with me. As you know, not everybody likes coming on and chatting with us, and that's totally fine. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's again the amalgamation word is amalgamation of both. So uh, right. on and off air. Gotcha. Okay. Well, let's start with one of those. And these are some of the favorites I came up with uh, that I liked in the book. But um, we're going to talk about a few of your personal favorites in a bonus Patreon episode later on. So people can check that out. But I want to start with an unfounded call. This one, like you said, defines paramalgamation. It has everything. Shadow people, men in black, UFOs. I mean, it was crazy. I'm like, what a way to kind of start the book off. So can you run us through an unfounded call? Yes, this one is a veritable buffet of weird shit. <laughs> um, and maybe that could be another title of a book. But uh, yeah, this... This poor guy. So he he's always wanted to be in law enforcement, and he finally gets in with a uh, sheriff's department. And it's in a rural county, and I'm not even going to uh, mention, you know, where or any of that stuff. And he was very highly anonymous, but I did see his credentials before we recorded, so I knew that he was legit. So this is back in uh, 2009, and he's working the night shift, and he's he's really – he and his whole, uh, I want to say platoon, but that would be the very wrong word, is <laughs> all of the rest of his deputies in the dispatch. They get these phone calls from an abandoned house. And there was, I think, three or four different 911 calls that were coming from the same home, and they would hang up. Problem is, the house is abandoned. So this guy would go out, he'd check the property, he'd find no one around, so he'd call it in, back to dispatch and go, it's an unfounded call, which means nobody there, it's weird, whatever. So they just probably chalk it up to, you know, a phone line having a problem or whatever it might be. And a few nights later, from the very last call, he says, okay, great, another call from the abandoned house. He heads out. And he, you know, it's nighttime, he's night's a night shift, pitch black, clicks on his flashlight and begins walking around the house. And he gets to the sliding glass door, and of course there's no blinds, nobody there. He looks in, and to his surprise, he sees a shadowy figure making its way up the stairs. So he... He puts on his radio, hey, radio silence, makes a call so that nobody comes over the radio while he's going to go in and check and see who's inside this house. He goes up the stairs and he checks the first room, totally empty, heads to the second one. He steps all the way inside 
and instantly, and of course, I, I, you know, when he's telling me this where I'm going, of course it did. I mean, why else would it stay on? Of course <laughs> not. The flashlight goes out and his radio is now completely dead. He's even to the point where he's like hitting the flashlight. You know, you, you do that. I mean, even in horror movies, they do that. But sometimes it actually really does work. It's why they do that. So he's trying to get to work. Nothing. It stays off. And because, again, no blinds, no curtains, there's enough ambient light from outside coming in to where he can see this massive dark figure standing in the far corner. And at this point, he's thinking it's, you know, it's still a person. So he informs the person, hey, I'm a sheriff's deputy. You know, you need to what are you doing in here? You, you can't be in here. Let's go. But it's not saying anything. Uh, and in fact, now that his eyes are starting to adjust, he's realizing that it is uh, much more massive than he thought. Um, in fact, it is nearly as tall as the ceiling itself. And it was he and it was much more like my own shadow person experience. Mm -hmm. He said it was, you know, take the darkest dark and it was darker than that. I mean, that's my description of my shadow beings. It was the darkest thing he'd ever, ever seen. So. At this point, unfortunately, it suddenly moves toward him, but it's not walking. It's just floating. It's floating towards him. And he does, in fact, reach for his weapon. And then suddenly bloop, he's in his car. So, what? <laughs> yeah. Now, not only is he in his car, but he's driving and he's already a half a mile down the road from this house and he has zero recall of what happened after he reached for his weapon or how he got into the car. And here's another aspect. So now we've got shadow people and the weird 911 call. We have missing time because it is an hour later. So the radio crackles on and it's, of course, his fellow deputies and probably his sergeant in charge checking on him. And he says, you know, code four, which means he's good. But soon after that, he gets this intense ringing in his ears, plus this horrible uh, dizzy feeling. And it was enough to where he pulled his car over. And, you know, when you're in law enforcement, you can't, it's much like being a pilot or something. Like you can't have, you know, any medical issues or mm -hmm. some, any kind of, you know, serious, uh, you know, mental issues, anything like that. You have to be, I mean, that's why these guys go through the screening they do. So, of course, he's very worried about himself, plus his job a little bit at this point, probably. So not wanting to broadcast this to everybody, he calls his sergeant and, you know, on like a phone and says, hey, I'm not feeling good. I'm going to pull the car over. And it's getting worse by the moment. And now he's short of breath. So he begins to to lay down and he goes, all right, I might actually pass out here. So I'm going to put my weapon and my badge and everything in the trunk. So that if somebody comes by, God forbid, and wants to, you know, take my stuff, they can't do it. So he actually does end up laying down and the guy gets there. They have to call an ambulance for him and he's taken to the hospital, but they release him with shortly after actually with no diagnosis he goes home, he tells his wife, but leaves out the part with the shadow figure. I, I don't blame him there. I mean, it's hard to explain, you know. Right. Um, 6 a.m. the next day, a knock on the door. And here's another aspect. Two men in black suits, sunglasses, and fedora-style hats. They start to ask him about what happened the night before. And, you know, once they finish all of this, they tell him, hey, you know, um, it's not disciplinary, but uh, we need you to turn your badge in. Like, you need to give it to us. And he's like, okay, um, what's going on? And they're like, no, it's it's nothing. You're not in trouble, but you can just, you can reapply when you feel better. He's like, okay. So he actually signs a paper that says, you've been released. You, he gave us, a, you know, his badge, everything's fine. And come back when you're, when you're feeling better. Now he admits like he's, He's a young deputy. It was his first law enforcement job. And he basically says, like, I was being a pushover and let them just – I signed the paper, gave them right. the badge, yeah, didn't like, think anything of it. He yeah. thought they were official. So he's in shock. His wife's in shock. She's probably going, like, what in the hell happened here, dude? And 
the next day comes and a deputy friend calls and he goes, Hey bro, why aren't you at work? And, and this guy's like, uh, you guys let me go. I signed a paper. Hello. And he, he says, we don't know anything about that. We have no clue what you're talking about. You're supposed to be at work. And then the captain calls and he's pissed and he's like, you better find that paperwork within 45 minutes or you're going to be in some serious trouble because you got to remember uh, the badge and stuff is not his property. So if he's been released or if he's not coming back to work, that is their property. You're going to get in a whole bunch of trouble for impersonating an officer if you're not really supposed to, you know, to have it. So captain's like, you better bring that down right now. So he's freaking out. He cannot find this paper for the life of him, which he had just signed the day before. It's just up and vanished. He, I think he had left it like right out on his dining room table or something, but now it's just gone. So he can't find the papers, but he's not going to drive down there without it. And then the captain rings and goes, Hey, don't worry, man. We found your badge. It's, it's with the County. They have it. He's like, okay, that's strange. And he goes, yeah, and um, we've been informed that you have epileptic seizures, which mm. is very shocking to him because he's not had any history of that. He's never had any of these kind of spells before, doesn't run in the family. So, of course, he's devastated because he's, like I said, he's always wanted to work in law enforcement. And, you know, the really sad thing about this is months go by. And he still presents with dizziness and the ringing in the ears. He's even had multiple tests, MRIs. And one of them actually came back at one point that he had a blockage in his left inner ear. And the doctor goes, well, we can try to prescribe some diuretics and to try to help flush whatever that might be out. But nothing really seemed to help this guy. Uh, and actually... It would it would kind of ebb and flow as far as the severity of the symptoms. But at one point, and this still to this day is true for him, he has actual hearing loss in his left ear uh, that has just never – that has never come back. So the dizziness and the vertigo and the ringing and things ebbs and flows, but the hearing loss is, is permanent, which is extremely unfortunate to, to hear. So the caveat to this whole thing is – He's, again, always wanted to be in law enforcement. Well, the men in black, I mean, let's face it, that's what we're kind of hinting that they were. Mm -hmm. The men in black said, you can reapply when you feel better. Well, he may not be feeling a whole lot better, but he's not having any of these blackouts or any of this other stuff that he, you know, after this missing time incident, he's not having that anymore. So he, he tries to get back out there and apply at various law enforcement agencies. And he said it always went really well until they got to the background check and his time at that particular sheriff's department because that sheriff's department wouldn't disclose the reason for his release, so the new place could not hire him. They just would not proceed with, with the hiring process. So that's it. It changed his life. Yeah. That one night, He's got the shadow person, the missing time. He's got the men in black. He's got this weird, you know, they sign this weird paper and then the paper's gone, forcing him to, I mean, to what? Not yeah. live and just, and ask why and how and why, you know, he um, still to this day, he is not working in law enforcement because of uh, after the events that happened that night. And he actually does have some, and, and you know this probably better than anybody with the people that you've spoken to post UFO slash, you know, alien, whatever you want to call it, encounters. Mm -hmm. But it seems like you see something in the sky for some of these folks or you see something weird that maybe could be attached to UFOs, like classic. And then stuff starts happening in your house. And he and his wife actually had shadow figures in the home and along with things being moved and thrown. And even this is a big bag of my hashtag hell no for me. They would have a baby cry coming from one of their unused bedrooms. Oh, uh, you're that's your least favorite thing. It, it's I, but that that I would be my least. I think I would take any yeah. any of the other stuff 
So I'll take it. But yeah, uh-huh. if you when oh a baby cry is is real cute until you feel like, I don't have a damn baby. So uh yeah. yeah. Um that th- that's such a good point though. I mean, almost every person I've spoken to about having like a very close encounter experience with a UFO or an abduction experience. Uh, uh, there's always some weird high strangeness aspect in their yeah. home after that, either like poltergeist like activity or something paranormal, or they start doing things completely out of character, you know, like, uh, what, 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 anything literally like stacking things in the home and they don't know why they're doing it or, um, yeah. walking backwards throughout the home and being like, oh. why the hell did I just do that? Like, yeah. It's so strange, Shannon. So, wow, this guy has been through a lot. He, he has, and I, I do keep in contact with him and I know that he's, he's still going through some weird stuff because honestly, I'll sometimes get an email from him from like, I could tell he's, you know, created another new email address, you know? So it's very strange. And it, it is, I mean, really on the periphery and on the face of it, it's a very sad story because, um, it was hard for him to tell it. I could tell that it had changed his whole life. Just that one night, that creepy night, seeing that, that damn shadow figure, then everything would just went really downhill from there for him. And of course the, the health issues are, uh, something that no one wants to, to deal with. And of course, you know, devil's advocate, you could say, well, maybe the whole thing was tied to some kind of an epileptic episode or something like that. But, um, mm-hmm. I don't know. That's a lot of, uh, weird stuff back to back and it doesn't explain actual, well, what they look like is people showing up and, and producing a piece of paper that he signed and his wife, you know, was even there at the time. Oh, okay. Uh, so that was nothing that he had imagined. You know, that was six in the morning. His wife was still home and she's like, hey, there's, you know, dudes at the door here. So yeah. uh, that, you know, that part was not imagined for him. Right. Yeah. I mean, the epileptic seizure thing, I maybe when it comes to missing time, that could attribute to that. Um, it, it's a good prosaic explanation for something like that. Like you don't remember these seizures happening. Um, yeah. But everything else, like you can't deny that that clearly was not connected to the, the seizure, if that was even the case. But man, my heart goes out to this guy. I mean, it's hard enough being in law enforcement, like the oh, pressures. Man you deal with day to day just serving and protecting but then to like have all this stuff drop into your lap in one night like oh man i i definitely feel for him that was a tough one yeah that was definitely a tough one yeah and something that um i don't remember if i asked him this or not but you know it it almost seemed like it was meant for him you know because it was only on on the night shift i don't remember him saying that they would get the unfounded calls during the day so mm, it was I don't know. Him, yeah. yeah, it just seemed like it, it was just meant to be for him, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yeah, that is the key word. Well, I hope he's doing better. I hope things cease. Um, but this let's move to this next one. This like I don't even know. I, I'm still trying to process this story, Shan, because mm-hmm. it's it's a phenomenon I've never heard of and something I never ever would want to experience um this was called the muted places and it's a man named uh i believe it's ash or Ashe yes in india and a very odd experience that he had um while while there so yeah could you maybe run us through a little bit of what ash experienced this is crazy Absolutely. And Ash was so fun to talk to. I still get emails about Ash and I, I think that his podcast might be out. I need to, I need to check with him, but he talked about how in India, you know, they don't, um, they're big on ghosts and spirits. Like talking to him, I, I learned so much. Uh, and he's like, yeah, they, you know, cryptids and Bigfoot and any of this other stuff is like, we don't talk about that, but mm-hmm. they're like big on spirit stuff, which is very interesting. It is called different um, cultures and how they yeah. perceive these things for sure. Like you, yeah. can, you will not be caught dead talking about like a ghost or demon in the house of a Mexican family. I can tell you from experience, I've made that mistake. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. They're so superstitious or like a Ouija board. I brought it up once with uh, my girlfriend who's Mexican and she, she just said straight up, <gasps> you will never bring that into this home. She said, someone runs up never and bring slaps it to my you. Girls. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, my grandma will bash that Ouija board over your head if you bring you that in. Shut your house. mouth. <laughs> anyway, How dare sorry. You? 
no, no, that, that is very interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, well, cause it is kind of interesting cause they have like the day of the dead and all that. So, uh, yeah. but other than that, like, you know, so you just don't really bring it up. Huh? I've you got can... some stories of La Llorona, um, from her grandfather that will freak you out. I'll try to get him. Mm-hmm. I'll try to get it recorded and share it with you. But yeah, like you do not mess with the ghosts in Mexican, uh, superstition. Oh, that's cool. I see. I didn't know that. I learned something every time I get on. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, so Ash was just telling me, Hey, I, I, I might start a podcast because over here it's rampant and over there there's no paranormal podcast. So I was like, well, yeah, you we never hear of podcast. stuff happening over there. Mm-mm, very rarely. So that's why when he emailed me, I was so happy when he agreed to come on. So but yeah, Ash was uh, it was episode 120. If anybody wants to check it out, he and I, I didn't um, I won't cover everything that he he talked about uh, in the book, but I'll I'll share uh, one of the the very interesting, uh, as Ryan said, I had never quite heard of anything like this before, but it does, I'll, I'll say at the end, something that may be a possibility and what it reminds me of. But uh, so, yeah, so we, this is in India. And uh, for those of you that don't know, and I, I, I didn't until, not really until Ash told me, but India is filled with uh, cities but also has forests and high desert and wetland areas, like a ton of them. And there's, of course, lots of wildlife there, uh, including um, many big cats that you have to really watch out your ass out for. Um, those are, he said, uh, very prevalent in India. So you really have to watch out. So um, he loved the wildlife and the outdoors enough to make it a profession. So he's a naturalist. Like he, you know, he's, he's out in the the bush every day, all day. That's his job. So, um, and the story that I'll, you know, say for the readers was told to Ash by a forest ranger. And it was a super, super creepy tale, um, that has to do with something called a Naga, but you guys have to read that in the book. It's really good, but this one's good too. I promise. Um, so, this one, he goes to an area of a wetland park to study sand boas, so snakes, right? So they're not far from the city at all, and the park is only roughly about eight square miles. Like eight. That's quite small. That's so, tiny. Yeah. Uh, Central Park is how big? Um, <laughs> then that's just Central Park. So. <laughs> So he leaves a few members of the team behind him and he's making his way like out of a clearing. He's standing in towards, um, he's, he's like facing this watchtower that lays on this wetland and the watchtower stands about 25 feet in the air and it's, it's well above the tallest of grasses in this area. And actually two of his team members are standing atop this watchtower And something very important to note is that in this location, the grass doesn't even reach his shoulders. So just keep that in mind, everybody. And so the man and the woman atop the watchtower are leaned forward and they are facing directly towards him. And they're talking. Uh, He waves at him like he's just walking that direction. So he waves. And oh, I forgot to mention, he is in charge of this team. He's the boss out here. So. That was important to mention on the onset. I apologize. (laughs) So he's the boss. So the boss is waving at these two people. They don't wave back. He's like, okay, whatever, guys. Waves again. Hey, how's it going? No response. And he makes a mental note since he is in charge to let them know, hey, any kind of communication out here is important, you know? So he's like, all right, fine, whatever. Turns to go back the way he came towards the group. But he can't find the trail. He can't find the clearing that he just left. And now keep in mind, Ash is someone that has spent years and years and years, including his childhood years, in the bush. He loves it. It, it, Like he has great sense of direction. He knows where he's going and where he's been. So he really should have been truly just mere steps from where he set off. But now none of this looks familiar to him. And he does get a little worried just because that's not like him to get kind of turned around. So he turns back to the tower and he waves again. And guess what? No response again. And mind you, they're still looking right at the guy. 
And he's going, what the hell is going on? They're not even reacting to me at all. So he's like, okay, well, this is on. And so instead of heading back again, he just heads forward towards the watchtower. And he's, okay, this part, this is when I go, what in the actual hell? <laughs> he says he's, he's so close to it that if he had a 20-foot pole, 20 feet, not very long, he could bonk these two folks on the head, okay? So that includes the the height of the of the damn thing. So a twenty foot pole, he could bonk him on the head. And as he's walking closer, they're still not reacting to his presence. And now he's in charge, so he's he's trying to save face here and not you know uh, we all have that ego in there, whether we like to admit it or not. And he's like, I really don't want to like call out to these people, but I'm getting a little freaked out here. So he decides to call out to him. Whatever the names are, I don't know. He didn't say it. You know, he's calling out to him. And he says, I called out so many times, I lost track. And still no response from these two people. So now he's really worried. And he notices that, and this is going to sound familiar to a lot of people, um, especially probably for the Bigfoot side of things. But he notices that all the normal daytime nature sounds are just gone. And he all of a sudden notes that, and the reason I brought up the topography of the area and the proximity to the cities and the wetlands and all this other stuff, this place was extremely near a very, very busy airport where massive aircraft were, you know, landing and taking off. You know, what is it every four or five, six minutes, whatever mm -hmm. it is. And he's like, don't hear anything. I have not heard a plane since this whole thing started. I hear no noises. What is going on? And in fact, there are massive power lines overhead, and usually those are humming. Totally silent. He's freaked out officially now, <laughs> and he's like, now I am scared. He had no problem admitting that he was terrified at this point. So he's like, okay, watchtower, not working out so well. So he turns again to try to find his way out from where he originally came, and all of a sudden, after a very short distance, he finds where he was. And everything looks familiar. And he can see the other team members are still there. They're still with their nose in the ground searching for these sand boas. And they can see and they can hear them. Everything's like totally back to normal. Of course, he's kind of going, that was odd, but I'm really glad that's over. He goes the long way, <laughs> which I don't blame him. He goes the long way to the watchtower and he climbs the stairs. And he can actually see right where he was when he was having this odd experience and he just could not understand how he possibly could have gotten turned around as far as where he came in versus where he wanted to go back out. And of course, why couldn't those other two people see or hear him? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's why I called it the muted places. He, he said he just felt completely and totally muted, not only muted, but invisible. So, you know, of course the, the tie-in here in my mind and uh, a subject that I love to talk about, and I've spoken to David myself, is, of course, the missing 411. And I can't help but go, God, is that what happens to those people? You know, yeah. when you're talking about a, a little kid or something that they're you know, 10 or 20 feet in front of you, they go over a hill and poof, they're gone. Just no sign of them ever, ever again. And, I, I mean, I, I don't know. But then you talk to uh, somebody like um, uh, Pam. Pam had come on, and, and her thing is the Fae. She sees Fae uh, not on a daily basis, but enough that it has changed her life. And um, she sees them in various places, including on people's backs in Walmarts or up in the trees on her own property. And she had an experience in Ireland where she had gone down this trail, and she and her friend actually basically made it into a place that very much reminds me of what Ash brought up and she had physical problems after that as well. Uh, so that mirrors what happened in our last story for an unfounded call. Uh, thankfully Ash, besides the fear and of course feeling invisible, uh, had no uh, lasting effects from what he can, he can tell, but he, he admits that that was very terrifying for him. And I can only imagine, especially when you feel like you're right there and these people are not reacting to you. Yeah. That must have been terrifying. 
yeah, like you literally do not exist in time and space in that moment. Yeah, like that, I, that's the stuff of nightmares for me. I think. I, I think I would love to experience something to a point in some of these stories where I could be even more empathetic to somebody, but mm-hmm. some of these stories you're going, uh, you're on your own on that one. I don't know <laughs> that I would want to experience that. You know, yeah. I, I always try to be very understanding and empathetic, but, uh, some of them you're going, yowza, that would suck really, really bad. Yeah. Um, and as you know, as I know, a lot of times, as long as it's not in your own home, you know, if people avoid going into the woods or they avoid going to a certain place because this shitty thing happened to them and it terrified them, it changed their life. Um, and, you know, the whole reason I mentioned the house thing is you, most people can't just up and freaking move if a shadow, massive shadow man is standing in your bedroom. Um, that's what makes them real assholes, to be honest with you, because they seem to love to terrorize people in their own homes. But yeah, uh, Ash, as far as I know, He's still doing his job. He's still out in the bush and, and still loves it. But he he was full of incredible stories. I love talking to him. This idea, too, of like the the forest or, you know, even let's say the wood, the wetlands or they there's something about them. The way they communicate with the people in them is so subjective and like so surreal like you can have two people in a room in a house and like you're kind of hearing and seeing the same stuff but when you get out in these places that are so like uncharted for most human beings some places have never even been stepped on by human feet there's something just magical about it and like there's probably stuff going on that we can't even fathom and this fact that he almost like blinked into a who knows what like an invisibility right. cloak or another dimension in where you know he was still in that wetland but not in like they couldn't see or hear it's just it's so crazy so this one yeah that was probably my favorite um i'm going to be honest cuz it just unnerved me to no ends like oh god um well here's here's another big one the war never ended this one was really it really put into perspective for me the idea of um of this like ghost tape theory that i've heard about in the supernatural where like memories and energies of not just one but like many spirits that can reside and almost play on like a loop of sorts like you're literally rewinding pushing play rewinding pushing play um so yeah could you maybe tell us a little about jeff and the state park that he worked at owls are somehow connected to ufos i don't say that lightly after over a decade of obsessive investigation i am convinced of this connection As strange as it may seem, people are seeing owls in the highly charged moments of a UFO sighting and within the challenging memories of UFO abduction. This mystery has been the focus of my research. My name is Mike Cleland, and I have explored these connections in my book, The Messengers. At its core, this book is simply a collection of stories, and each is a remarkable real-life experience. The Messengers is also my own story of how owls played a role in my life. The Messengers is the first in a trilogy of books. All my books are available on Amazon in paperback, ebook, and very soon as audiobooks. Both Beyond the Fray books are co-authored by myself and, of course, uh, G. Michael Hoff, Mm -hmm. first name Jeff. And, uh, you know, he's written like 40 something books. He's quite prolific. Prolific. And yes, he's a busy man. And he's uh, he's my partner in this whole thing. And this is actually his story that he was on uh, episode 230. uh, And it was it was all about Point Lookout State Park in Maryland. So um, which is cool because I got some feedback from people going, oh, my God, I went there. And yeah, it's definitely got a creepy vibe. So um so this takes us back uh, before Jeff actually went into the service. And, um, you know, for people that don't know, Point Lookout State Park during the time of the Civil War was actually a POW camp. And visitors and employees alike have had experiences there. And again, before he left for recruit training in the Marine Corps, he actually lived and worked in the park for three months uh, because his older brother, John, 
who was a park ranger at the time, got him a job there. It seemed like, you know, a perfect summer job before you go off to uh, uh, basic training and all of that. So uh, what he did there was actually work in the camp office and would do kind of random jobs in the park. So uh, himself, his brother, and another ranger named uh, uh, Jamie, they lived in a small single room building, and, and then they just partitioned it off with lockers and probably had a uh, one couch in there and we're sleeping on cots, but perfect for young guys. He loved it. And, you know, something to kind of preface hearing about what Jeff experienced there would be the fact that during the civil war, it was, it was meant to only hold about 10,000 prisoners, but instead they held over 20,000. So you could imagine the kind of conditions that these guys were yeah. were faced with and the death and the sickness and the suffering that they were going through. So that is a, a snapshot, a just quick snapshot of uh, Point Lookout State Park. But uh, so even before Jeff sleeps one single night in the park, he has something happen. And the three of the guys are sitting in their living room and the front door opens. And the other ranger, Jamie, had a dog, and the dog immediately jumps to its feet and has its hair raised up. Not a good sign, guys. I'm just going to let you know right there. Yep, it's always um, the animals first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you see that, you better just go ahead and get the thermal camera out because you might want to catch something. Uh, yeah, and it's, and it's growling uh, to go along with the hair standing up. And Jeff looks over at Jamie. He's like, what's going on, man? And Jamie only smiles and answers, oh, we have a visitor. Like, creepy. He's like, okay. And so he keeps watching the dog. And they're still sitting on the couch with a, a space in between uh, Jeff and Jamie. And when he told me this part, I'm like, I can see this. And the, it just got, gets the hair raised on yourself. He says that he's watching the dog. And the dog is watching from the front door. And it starts to slowly turn its head towards the couch as if something had come in the front door mm -hmm. and then sat down in between the two of them because it's now staring directly in between Jamie and Jeff on the couch. So, um, yeah, that wasn't quite the empty space that it looked to be from, from what the dog was saying. And, of course, Jeff's like, as far as I could tell, there's nothing there. But the dog kept growling. And after a minute, it its head starts to move back to the front door. So dog calms back down, stops growling, sits back down. And Jeff is like, okay, I guess we did have a visitor. And, you know, Jamie's just like, he's been there for a while, so he already knows. So he's just kind of grinning about it. And at this point, G is like, it's cool. I like this place. No big deal. But, you know, it doesn't end there for him. So few weeks go by and he's working really long hours, mostly night shift in the camp office. And he does admit to seeing some door slam or having items go missing, but he wanted, he really did. He wanted a profound experience and he's like kind of waiting for this to happen. And, and it's not until, uh, one night in the middle of the summer, uh, there's another ranger. Um, his name is uh, Mike. He shows up in the patrol car and he's like, hey, G, I got a job for you at the beach house. And this was a building on the beach side of the river. And it was full of basically the bathrooms and the showers and the changing stalls. So they pull up to the beach house and Mike hands Jeff a radio and a flashlight and drives away. And he's like, OK, well, this is going to be a whole lot of fun. <laughs> so, you know, part of his job was to clean things. So, you know, he's there to clean the bathrooms and the stalls and all this. So he heads to the women's side first and he unlocks the door, turns on the lights. He heads to the back of what is a building to the supply closet and he gets out what he needs, uh, mops and buckets and things. And he's cleaning one of the stalls when he hears the front door to this side of the building swing open. It's very distinct. And he hears hard soled shoes crunching sand into the ceramic tile. I mean, they're right on the beach. Sounds like sand on tile. So the footsteps get almost all the way to the shower when G calls out, who's there? And there's, of course, no response. And the steps stopped, which is kind of creepy to me when you really think about that, because it did react to him. Mm -hmm. 
and he's got nothing else. So, and by God, I would have done the same thing. He grabs his massive, uh, mag light and those are pretty old school and like cops use them and stuff. And, um, you can use those as a weapon for sure. They're heavy as hell. <laughs> so he grabs that thing and he makes his way around the building and he's, he's going stall to stall and throwing the curtains back. And, you know, I mean, to me, that seems really like, I mean, what else are you going to do? And he even said, it seems like it's right out of a damn horror movie, but that's what he's doing. Cause he's like, I know I heard somebody in here. Nobody's back there. Nobody at all. Can't find a soul. So he goes back to work on the other side and he's got his head down. And I actually think he's like cleaning around like a toilet area or something. So he's facing towards a wall and like a few seconds later, you know, his footsteps are gone. But he just knows that there's someone standing directly behind him. And he said that there was such intense fear all of a sudden in those moments that it prevented him. He just couldn't bring himself to turn around. It prevented him from doing so. And he's he's just absolutely terrified. So all he can do is yell, no. And then he he manages to stand and he does turn at this point and he again yells, no. But there's nobody there. He can't see anybody, but he can still feel this presence there. So at this point, he's like, screw this. I'm out. I'm, I'm over this. I don't care about, you know, claying the rest of this place. So he quickly just throws everything back in the supply closet, gets Mike on the radio, and he's like, come get me, dude. Um, I'm done. Let's go. And the second he gets in the car, uh, Mike can like instantly tell something's wrong with them. And Jeff admits he saw nothing, but something was in there. He goes, I, I know that something was there. I heard some things. I felt something. And Mike just replies, well, yeah. Why do you think I had you do it? I'll never go in there again. <laughs> so, <laughs> he got totally set up on that one. Mike was totally like, Hey, new kid. All right. You're going to the beach house. Have fun, buddy. Yeah, so that wow. that place, um, a very active location. I would love to make it out there one of these days, and and do some investigating and and spend the night, uh, go in the beach house and, yeah, you know, hey, I'll do some cleaning to to have a, a creepy experience like that. That was it was pretty cool. That pretty hey, cool we have him come on and and tell those stories. Absolutely, yeah, and it 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 makes sense that you two are now working together. It's just a uh, match made in paranormal and weird heaven, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, and it's it's you know I like when because Jeff's got uh, you know military background, and all of that. It's really cool when I mean, just like in your field, it's just it's it lends credibility when you have somebody like that willing to go. Yeah, I've had some weird shit happen. I've seen some weird shit, and I'm willing to talk about it. Um, I love when people like that come forward, you know, just like my sheriff's deputy for an unfounded mm -hmm. call. You always just go, this is great. I mean, not that we're, we're knocking, uh, like myself, like quote unquote normal folks at all, <laughs> but, uh, it, it, it does lend a little bit more credence to a story when you have folks like this come forward. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's the same in the UFO field. You know, if we can get pilots and military people to go on the record, like that, that just ups the credibility and the legitimacy. I mean, these yeah. are trained observers. So if they're saying they still can't identify things in our skies or, um, you know, stuff like that, then there's a problem. There's definitely not just a problem. There's clearly something anomalous occurring. Which is so wonderful. It we is. love it. It's the world we live in. Um, all right. Well, the next one I want to I wanna um, wrap up with, Shan, is Wendigo in Iowa. The legend of the Wendigo. It's admittedly, it's something that I haven't really looked much into. So mm -hmm. could you maybe give us a little crash course on what a Wendigo is and, uh, yeah, how it may have been experienced in Iowa, of all places? Yeah, so the Wendigo is, is something that is... It's supposed to be, and sometimes I think that skinwalkers and, and Wendigo might be a little interchangeable. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on what you're reading. But a Wendigo is something that, it is human, but it's it's not. But then sometimes if you talk to or read another blog, it's just a straight cryptid, meaning that it always was an emaciated 
naked white thing with sometimes horns and sometimes not um, <laughs> and always just creeping around and never seems to eat a damn hamburger because it's always emaciated. But um, yeah, Wendigo are, depending on who you talk to again or depending on what you read, they can either be good or bad. Uh, much like the Mothman, you know, uh, it's either a harbinger of doom or it's there to warn you of impending doom. So that would be a good thing. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and this woman that I talked to, I still am in touch with her. Uh, she still has some kind of sort of activity uh, in her home. This is another incident where she sees something weird and then it just escalates from there and it seems to touch other aspects of her life, including her children, which uh, actually really uh, pisses me off when that happens. Um, I can't imagine, you know, something that you can't see, you can't feel, you can't touch, you can't fight, and it's messing with the kids. Right. That's never a good thing. So, and you know, she and I agreed with lack of anything else to label this thing, which is, again, why it was perfect for paramalgamation is we just couldn't think of anything else. To, we called it a Wendigo. And she did first. Admittedly, I didn't uh, put that in her head or anything. But it was something that well, – and I'll, I'll get to the story shortly. Everyone's like, will you shut up and get to the story? <laughs> uh, you know, But once she had seen this thing, she didn't really even know know what to go look for as far as googling or any of that stuff and admittedly she was scared out of her wits so she probably didn't want to but she had been listening to another podcast and they mentioned the physical attributes and the characteristics of this this wendigo is what they were specifically covering and she would then put wendigo into google lovely google and she said the very first picture that came up it it just, it was, she, her blood ran cold. She's like, oh my God, that's what I saw that night. So, you know, basically we're not calling it Wendigo, but we are because for lack of a better term and, and for identification purposes, that's the closest thing that she, that she could uh, come up with. So, um, all right. So this is not long ago. This is only a few years back in, uh, in 2017. And before she told me, the only other person that had heard this story was her husband. So 2017, we're, we're in rural Iowa, and she has a job in a, a larger city, which meant a pretty massive commute, and uh, one way was an hour and a half. So that's quite the bummer. I've had to do that myself. And this poor thing, she has to be to work at 5 a.m. So that means she's on the road really early, and it's always dark. And... What made this time even more difficult is she's pregnant. Uh, so on this particular morning, she recalls it's it's very dark. She said it was it was clear though, no clouds, and there were stars shining really quite brightly. So there's enough of that ambient light around. And she's not ten minutes from her house when her headlights touch on something off to the left. And it's just past a small bridge that crosses a creek. And immediately, of course, she's in Iowa. She thinks it's an animal. So she begins to slow down. And it doesn't move. And she's getting, you know, closer and closer. And because it's, it seems larger than she thought, she's like, oh, it actually looks like a piece of, like, equipment or something. So driving closer, she realizes it's in the shape of a person. But it's naked. And it's extremely emaciated. And it's actually sitting uh, with its knees pulled up to its chest. And then its arms are, you know, if you sit down and you wrap your arms around your legs as such. Um, it's got super long arms, slender fingers. And this is a really messed up part. But it's, its torso, she said, was much too long for a normal human being. Um it, it thankfully, it was not looking at her. And, it, and, and going back to the torso, this is an important part. It was so long that she guessed if it stood up, it would be about eight feet tall. Oh so, nope, no thank you, screw that. Yeah, just this, this skinny little naked thing, eight feet tall. No wonder it's so skinny. It, its digestive tract is like 
Yeah. It's three feet long. Right? <laughs> so it's, it's like, I uh, I did eat a hamburger. And where do you, what do you think? I'm trying here, oh, guys. God. Eight feet yeah. tall. That is terrifying. Oh, yeah. That's coming um, from a leprechaun over here, by the way. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> a leprechaun. <laughs> no, you're plaid, man. Stop it. Plaid oh. leprechaun, man. There we go. Yeah, I'm pla- <laughs> yeah, there you go. New nickname. All right. Sorry to interrupt. We need we need to <laughs> we need all the new hashtags to come out for that. You know. Yep. Make it happen, <laughs> ITF folks. Yes, right. Hey, we're still working on that tulpa. Remember when we did the tulpa idea and I oh, got so experiment. much yep. mail? Yep. 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 You were like, "You're s- don't be stupid. <laughs> you can't do that." I was like, you're right. It's pretty stupid. And we're not going to do it. I'm sorry. Yes. We were going to create a, an ITF thought form. It's been put it's, on hold. It's a great idea. I don't know what we're talking about. I would just send it to Sam's house. You know it would, what it would be. is oh, a yeah. massive cricket with a human head. Yep. That's favorite. what it would be. <laughs> it's his absolute favorite. He loves that, guys. If you can send him p- tons of pictures of that, he'd love it. Yes. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. He would hate that. Mr. Sam Sheeran at G. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if, if you want to do a rendering of a massive grasshopper with a human face and send it to... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <clears throat> Only the, uh, the hardcore ITF folks will know all about that stuff, oh, right? Oh, yes. Plaid, plaid man. And, Otherwise, people are like, what the hell are they talking like, about? They're like, is this the wind part of the Wendigo story or not? <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. So, all right. So let me get back. Eight feet tall. Mm-hmm. Um, some other the details is that its skin is uh, either black or dark gray and that it's covered in hair. Uh, she says her headlights made it shine as if it were wet and had crawled out of maybe the creek that it was standing over. So, so nice um, to think of it. Also being in the water, for some reason, that just creeped me out pretty yeah. bad. Um, the face itself, though, is bone white. And the hair is hanging over the eyes. And she said to me, like, sh- she's probably thankful for that. Um, because, now, keep in mind, it's it's not looking at her yet uh, until she gets to where she's about to go by it. And it turns and stares at her. Uh, she's panicked. She guns it, uh, tries to calm down, but admits she kept checking her mirrors. I'm sure she couldn't see a damn thing back there, but I probably would have done the same thing. And halfway through the drive, she's like, okay, I'm going to stop, grab some water, take a little break, get back on the road, try to calm down. Because, and you hear a lot of people say this, if you, you know, if you just kind of see something, a blip of something and you're alone, and I just talked to a guy last night about this uh, Bigfoot. It, it's going to air tonight. Like, he's going, if I was alone, I could have maybe said I was losing it or I had hallucinated or I misidentified, right? But mm-hmm. uh, so that's what she's thinking. Another 10 minutes down the road, she's feeling a little better until she's cresting up a steep hill and she sees the creature once again. Except this time it's crouched. As if it could, you know, do a pouncing motion of some sort. It's crouched in the middle of the road. And she swerves around it. And what else is she going to do? She drives to work. Uh, she gets, she admits, she's like, I got there early because I was gunning it. Um, and I'm, I'm saying this all with a smile. But uh, admittedly, she, she teared up and was very emotional while she was telling me this. So this was an extremely traumatizing thing for, for this young woman. Mm -hmm. So her coworkers can tell something's wrong, but she's not about to say anything about that. I mean, who would blame her? Um, Shortly after this sighting of either the same creature, that was the big question. Is it the same one or are there two of them? You know what I mean? Like that was my question. I'm like that either way it's messed up. Um, but she has a, an emergency and she nearly miscarries the baby that she was carrying. Uh, and of course the question is what caused it? She said, yeah, it could have been stress or did this creature either warn her of a problem or cause it itself? Uh, so that's when the whole Wendigo thing came up and being a harbinger and all this mm-hmm. other stuff. So um, that's, you know, but that is not the end of her story. They then had, as I mentioned, some stuff go on in the home with the kids. I mean, it's it's one of those things where it seems like 
like we were joking about the Hellraiser box in the beginning, right? Like, why not? 2021's coming. Let's yep. do hell. Let's, let's release, you know, everything, uh, unleash it on the earth. Um, it does seem like when you see something real goddamn weird, it, it really does for some people open Pandora's box and it becomes just this avalanche effect of other phenomena happening. Now, you know, it's not like she saw that creature in her home. Thank God. Yeah. Uh, I'd be burning that place down and, and I don't know Starting what you. else to yeah. protect myself. Yeah. But, um, other things were happening and, you know, her, her cute little son who actually I'm, I, if, if she listens to this, I'm going to FaceTime with him pretty soon. Cause he's just such a little sweetheart and he's way into Bigfoot and I'm really proud of him. <laughs> he still doesn't sleep in his own room. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So, you know, it's kind of an, an, another, it, episode where it's like an ongoing case and I'm, I'm trying to help people as I can, but, um, you'll never hear me say I'm a paranormal expert or a Bigfoot expert or an expert at anything, you know? Um, I, I, I know people that are better at this stuff than me as far as categorizing things or maybe trying to help some of these folks that have this stuff going on, especially in your own home. It's one thing to go to a haunted location or to go to a creepy place and be able to leave it. Mm-hmm. But once it's in your own home, it's a whole nother ball of wax right there. So, <laughs> um, yeah. And if anybody wants to listen to that one, that is episode two, two, two. So, um, but yeah, that one, uh, it, that also I'd say is in my top 10 of like, holy shite, you yeah. know, uh, episodes and sightings that, that would really mess you up, I think. And um, I'm sure that uh, uh, the commute was kiboshed after that, I'd say. Or at least in not during nighttime hours. That I would help a little so. bit. Yeah. yeah. You bring up a good point, though, Shan. Like, uh, the impact these things can have on people. Everyone you've spoken of tonight, like, had clear implication to what they experience. Like, it affects your life thereafter and like you said like it's the same with me in the ufo field like whenever whatever news or interviews they say oh are you so you want to be called a ufo expert i'm like what no i'm not an expert on this i don't know what the hell ufos are i i research it i interview people who've seen them uh but nobody's an expert none of us how can you be yeah how can you be it's impossible like the people with the bigfoot how in the hell can you be a bigfoot expert that's impossible exactly and you you brought up another good point like there are far more uh experienced and uh educated and scientific people out there who do actually investigate and um i have a big chapter in a book that uh may or may not be coming out soon by beyond the frame Uh publishing i won't say anything else um where (laughs) where i tackle that very issue like who are the people out there actually making progress on these topics um but for people like you and me we we are listeners like we the reason you and i connected and worked together is because we love stories and we find value in those stories and lessons to be learned and sometimes for people it's just getting it out to someone like is enough right she may never know what the wendigo was um you know this guy may never know what actually happened during that missing timey experience but at the end of the day like we can now share that story with other people who might be able to find answers for you or even just relate in some small way so i think that's what uh you've done with the podcast and these books is get it out to people and normalize these conversations more well, thanks, Ryan. I appreciate that. And, you know, I think uh, one of the biggest things that we do is we just we're, we try to be good listeners. You know, uh, people will I'm sure you get it, too. Like you'll get emails or, or messages or or you're talking to somebody and you can hear the the angst in their voice and they want answers and they want you to answer it for them. And they don't want to hear that. We you know, we don't know for sure. We just we don't. Nobody. The... Nobody can hardest part you're so right the hardest part is when someone comes to you and says what is this what am i experiencing how can i stop it or like what do i do and you just you if you're a ethical person you have to say i don't know what you can do but here's 
maybe some suggestions, go talk to a therapist, an actual therapist, and then take it from there. But yeah, I do. That is the biggest struggle with what we do is people want answers and um, we may never find those answers, but at least we can all kind of deal with that struggle together. You know, whether it's paranormal, supernatural, UFOs, what have you, like these things affect us and they are part of our human experience. Uh, whether they're human or not themselves. So, yeah. Yes, exactly. No, and, you know, and just to add on to us kind of on our soapbox about no experts, which is true, by the way, I'm not going to take that back, but <laughs> I will say that I do have people that I defer to that I, I know they have more experience than me. They've talked to more people than me. They've actually been in more locations than me, you know, maybe specifically talk, talking about, uh, just in general, paranormal, ghost stuff, spirits, shadow people, um, maybe even up up to, you know, demonic presences, which I think that word gets tossed around far too much, but that's another subject for another another day. But, you know, people like, um, I'll defer people to Pete Havilland. I mean, he's amazing. He's been in this like almost 30 years. Like he's, you know, gone to all these locations and he, he just, and he doesn't say he's an expert, but he might, well, I know he does. He doesn't might. That's why I defer people to him. I refer, I should say. I defer by referring. There we go. Um, <laughs> it's a roundabout uh, way he, of saying it. I like yeah, it. Yeah, I spit that one out. That I think sense. I got that. Uh, but he will have more ideas and and ways for them to try to help themselves. Um, obviously, nobody's jet set, especially nowadays. So, you know, he's better at saying, okay, well, let me look at the evidence and here's some things you to try in your own home, like tonight, or some things that you can get to try to help yourself out. And, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, opinions on that kind of thing. I get that. And it's, it's widely speculative as far as what any of this stuff is. We don't know. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, there are definitely some people out there that they know their shit. And I, I, I trust them enough to send people that go, Oh, my God, I need help. Please help me. Please help me. You know, I'm not gonna act like I have you know, any more tools in my bag than people that I know have got bigger, better tools in their bag. <laughs> so I have no problem going, Hey, I, I'm not the, I'm not the person for you, but I know someone that might be able to help you. Exactly. I, I couldn't agree more about that aspect of all of this is, you know, if someone does have the answer or claims to have the answer, run, run as fast run. as you can. <laughs> run so fast. Either that or ask them, oh, yeah, how much is it going to cost me <laughs> if, to find those answers? Oh, yeah, but, if they haven't told you already, because yeah. usually that's one of the first <laughs> things that comes out, right? Yeah, that's a good filtering mechanism right there mm -hmm. for sure. Well, yeah. Shan, um, you're going to stick around to share a couple more stories with us over yes. on Patreon, some of your favorites. So I highly suggest people who are um, Patreon subscribers go check that out right now. It should be available right after this interview airs. And um, if you're not, you can check it out at patreon.com slash somewhere skies. But before we go, Shan, um, what's, comes, what's coming next from Beyond the Fray, both in terms of your own books and uh, the publishing company in general? Anything? you can share with us um actually i got a little tickle in my throat up <laughs> plaid man <clears throat> um <laughs> there we go no we actually do have some very exciting things coming up which as you kind of mentioned we won't say anything further but uh, a few authors that you guys may know very well at this point but boy we've got a lot of uh authors under our wing now that have new projects coming up and people that uh, i mean we haven't even really announced as far as uh, coming on with Beyond the Fray Publishing. And, you know, if, oh, and I want to mention this. Um, we are working on Bigfoot Part 2. Oh, part sweet. Two. Okay. Uh, so if anybody wants to come on, uh, either on or off the air, share your story, or even email it in to me, Shannon, at IntoTheFrayRadio.com. I'm looking for those Bigfoot tales. I mean, you guys know how much I love the big hairy guy. So uh, it was a natural progression for Jeff and I to work on a second edition for Beyond the Free Bigfoot. So that's coming up next for us uh, in specifically. And uh, of course, into the fray radio.com is where you can find the show. And of course, any podcatcher and I put it on YouTube, all that good stuff. And uh, you know, if you want to chat, reach out, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the usual suspects and uh, uh, Shannon, into the fray radio.com. I think I've already given that out. There you go. That's, that's twice. <laughs> you guys won't lose that one. And just as a teaser for you guys in the Patreon, 
the story that I'm about to share with Ryan for the Patreons is probably one of my top, like, favorite of all time episodes, which I always say I don't have, but I, I, yeah, this one I love a lot. And in fact, this is one that I got more correspondence, and still to this day, I have gotten more correspondence about this episode than I ever have. Uh, and I, I, okay, so really quick, sorry, before we go. When people bring up EVPs, I usually roll my eyes because uh, they're highly suggestive things. Um, just like when I'm talking about Bigfoot and tree structures, I'll usually roll my eyes. If, if somebody wants to like talk about it or say, I just roll my eyes. I don't get excited about EVPs for, for that side of things or tree structures for Bigfoot. Um, I just tree structures are actually just as suggestive as, as EVPs because a lot of weird shit happens in the woods when, when cold snaps run through and winds come through nature does its own weird stuff. Um, so anyway, the long and short of it is this episode, I got so much correspondence because it, it like exploded on social media and in my email going, there is a word spoken twice underneath your voice and you have to go to this time marker you've got to go listen to this and I went to listen to it and I immediately heard what it said like usually you know you watch Ghost Adventures and they've got the you know the subtitle up there yeah. with what they think it is and you're like oh yeah I totally hear that but if somebody put up a, a totally different subtitle you could go oh, well, oh I heard like that, that too yeah it's very persuasive. yeah it's very yeah. very suggestive but in this case I couldn't deny what was being said, and it tied in so incredibly well, not only for the subject matter for the episode, but for the very part of that episode that we were talking about this. And it blew my F in mind. And I am I'm extremely skeptical with stuff like that, and it really doesn't float my boat, as I said. But in this particular case, I was blown away. So that is the that is the story that I, I'm going to share with the uh, with your patrons, and I'm very excited about that because I haven't talked Ooh. about a uh, good old, good old, uh, you know who in a while. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm really excited. Well, that that is the best teaser to uh, join the Patreon I've ever heard. I can't even sell it <laughs> better myself. So we're gonna head on over there. And um, Shan, I gotta say before we go, the book again is Beyond the Fray: Paramalgamation. It's available at BeyondTheFrayPublishing.com. Amazon, everywhere you get your books, check it out. And Shannon, thank you once again for joining me on Somewhere in the Skies. Thank you, good sir. Until next time. Somewhere in the Skies is produced by Third Kind Productions in association with the Entertainment One Podcast Network.